Hello, hello. Nice to see you all here tonight. Hi, Dolores K. Steve Day, nice to see you. Joy Ramsey, nice to see you. John Siena. Hello to you, Deborah Wilson. Hi, Deborah. And uh, Joanne Riccadio is here too. Hi, Joanne. How are you? Susan Eldridge. And I think there are a few other people here whose name I haven't seen yet. But welcome to you all. Okay. Let's go over Stephanie's book and hit the high spots. From start to finish now. Okay, so here's a table of contents. Let's briefly review the introduction. Nice aphorism to start with. It ain't what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And, of course, she picks up on the Uncle Sam thing, the empty pockets, and the how you're going to pay for it. And raises the big question, what if the federal budget is fundamentally different than your household budget? What if I showed you that it was? And what if I could convince you? that finding the money to do the things you want to do is not the problem. Then she points up the main objective in the book to use the lens of modern monetary theory to explain the Copernican shift to get people to look at things in a different way. Um, to recognize that uh, the government is the currency issuer. That it's the currency issuer, not the taxpayer that finances all government expenditures. Then she starts going personal. How she herself only saw this when she did her own investigation in response to something she had heard, which sounded ridiculous. 
and she sort of hits the high spots of some of the major concepts she's going to cover in the book. And then she relates uh, the recent events of the recession of 2007 to 2009. And how the reaction to that was to spend too little to end the recession. How the Obama administration had a chance to try to push through a recovery package of $1.8 trillion, but how it missed that chance, how long it took to recover, what a travesty that all was. And then the question, why didn't we make better policy And that's when she puts forward the idea that it's the problem of myths. And then she tells you what she's going to do. She's going to take the first six chapters of the book to dispel the deficit myths that have hobbled us as a country. And then she summarizes what she's going to do in the book. And so this serves as a proper introduction that whets the appetite, whets, W-H-E-T-S, the appetite to read the, the book. She mentions all kinds of real crises that we face in this country and then states plainly the national deficit is not a crisis. <laughs> she goes on a little more, talks about how we have to tax the rich, but not because we need uh, their money, but for other reasons. She goes into that. Those reasons, of course, so later on in the book, She says the economic framework she's advocating for is asking for more fiscal responsibility from the federal government, not less. And then says we just need to redefine what it means to budget our resources in a reasonable way. So basically she's talking about real fiscal responsibility, which is a subject that um, I wrote about in two of my ebooks. So, of course, okay, I love this introduction. I love the idea of overcoming the myths. In fact, I wrote another ebook called Fiscal Myths of Campaign 2016. Then she briefly talks about the COVID crisis. And ends by saying the next year will be incredibly difficult for all of us. We'll live with a heightened state of anxiety until the virus is contained and a vaccine is widely available. She says, okay, many of us will experience social and economic uh, hardship. There's enough to worry about without piling on additional concerns over our nation's fiscal situation. And she ends by saying, this is as good a moment as any to learn some important lessons about where money comes from and why the federal government and only the federal government can step up and save the economy. And that's the introduction. I think it was quite an appropriate introduction. Does the job of inviting people to read the book. It was written very clearly. Clearly. 
So it was a very good introduction. And the first thing she did, does, is basically tell us, don't think of a household. Don't think of a household. She doesn't want us to think of a household, but of course there's the paradox. If you tell somebody not to think of something, they may start to think of that thing. <laughs> and to fit with that title of the first chapter, there's the quote from President Obama's State of the Union address in 2010. Families across the country are tightening their belts and making tough decisions. The federal government should do the same. And the myth, the first, the federal government should budget like a household. And the reality, unlike a household, the federal government issues the currency it spends. So then she talks about personal experiences of her own. She's very good at introducing um, personal experiences and stories to try to make her narrative come alive and give people relief so that they're not always dealing with abstractions. She did that very well. She thinks the household myth that the government is like a household is the most pernicious one uh, that she has to deal with. It. And says, so when we hear someone come along and talk about government finances in ways that uh, remind us of our own, it's home. It's got a folksy kitchen table feel to it. She talks about the problems with that analogy. Talks about how the analogy resonates with us that we know commonsensically we have to set aside savings for the future that our savings for the future are real savings and that if we save for the future we get to spend for the future more than we otherwise would spend talks about how families understand the realities of saving and spending. But then she says, but Uncle Sam is different. And to understand why we go right to the heart of MMT. And what's the heart of MMT? It's the distinction between a currency issuer versus a currency user. Both the U.S. Treasury and its fiscal agent, the Federal Reserve, have the authority to issue the U.S. dollar. This might involve um, minting the coins in your pockets, printing up the bills in your wallet, or creating digital dollars known as reserves that exist only as electronic entries on bank balance sheets. Now, the Treasury manufactures the coins and the Federal Reserve creates uh, the rest which is not exactly true. The Federal Reserve doesn't create uh, the bills in your wallet, though it does issue those bills. It issues the bills, but uh, the Bureau of, uh, what the hell is it called again? I'll think of it. It's the mint uh, that does uh, the coin. Okay. And uh, the Bureau of Printing and whatever uh, that creates uh, the bills. But right now, only the Federal Reserve is doing the issuing of the currency. As Federal Reserve notes, the bills printed up by the Treasury these days are Federal Reserve notes and not uh, Treasury notes. And Stephanie points out that we currency users cannot manufacture the dollars. 
even quotes the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis saying that the U.S. is the sole manufacturer of dollars, the U.S. government, the sole manufacturer okay, of dollars. She mentions that the U.S. Constitution grants the federal government the exclusive right to issue the currency. And she points up the fact that when it comes to issuing the currency, the U.S. government has a monopoly. Everyone else is merely a currency user. And she brings in Sesame Street and a graphic showing that households, businesses, states, and local governments are all users of the currency. But the federal government is different because it's an issuer of the currency. And then she goes through the difference between the monetary sovereign who issues the currency by exclusive right and who doesn't promise to convert that currency into something else such as gold or some other country's currency and who refrains from borrowing in a current currency that isn't okay its own and who, by the way, also taxes in its own currency. And she says when a country issues its own non-convertible fiat currency and only borrows in its own currency, that country has attained monetary sovereignty. And she points up once a country has attained uh, 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 such uh, sovereignty, it doesn't have to manage its money the way households would. So she goes through this chapter explaining why some countries fix their exchange rates, why they give up of their sovereignty she points up that the United States can't end up like Greece because Greece gave up its monetary sovereignty when it joined uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Eurozone and adopted the Euro, got rid of the drachma. And then she leaves us with Margaret Thatcher and points out that Thatcher used a taxing and borrowing and then spending model, claiming that the state has no source of money other than the money people earn themselves. If the state wants to spend more, it can only do so by borrowing your savings or by taxing you more. And this led Thatcher to say, there's no such thing as public money. A lie that was told to the British people, though she says, was this an innocent mistake? or a carefully crafted statement, she says she's not sure. But her remarks concealed the currency issuing power of the state. And she points up that our leaders still act as though we're on the gold standard, that we don't actually have monetary sovereignty. She takes the reader through that in this first chapter. Um, everything is very simply written. Okay. It's at the level of an intelligent high school student who knows how to read and who reads well. Obviously, it's not for all high school students, but it's written at a level which is certainly accessible to all college students, if it's not accessible to them, they don't belong in college. So it's intended for a wide public audience. She critiques the TABS model. 
she points out, though, many people still think in terms of the TABS model, still talk in terms of the TABS model, including even Bernie Sanders. She talks about uh, deficits being very, very common, talks about the PAYGO system and how it assumes the TABS model in fact, the PAYGO systems reduces tabs to just taxing and spending to only TS because it looks askance at borrowing to finance new expenditures. Under PAYGO, borrowing is technically off limits. She asked whether this is good economics, whether it's a good political strategy. She says, it certainly sounds like a wholesome approach, but it's rooted in the floor understanding of how the federal government actually spends in fact, it gets everything backward, and then she gets into the STAB model, spend first, tax, and borrow later, and maybe not even borrow. And ends that section by saying the government, your taxes don't actually pay for anything, at least not at the federal level. The government doesn't need our money. We need their money. We've got the whole thing backward. Then she goes into our own experience with Warren Mosler and her own investigations. And when she talked to Warren in 1997, she was midway through a PhD program in economics. And someone shared uh, Warren's little book with her, Soft Currency um, Economics, where she first saw the STAB model. The Warren didn't call it the STAB model. That's Stephanie's construct her meme, her way, okay, of putting it. But that is what she learned, okay, from Warren, that a sovereign government doesn't go around looking for someone else to pick up the tab. It just spends its currency into existence. And she points out that Warren is considered the father, okay, of MMT because he brought these ideas to a handful of MMTers in the 1990s. And she talks about the importance of the model. And the basic thing that Warren taught, that the government doesn't want um, um, the dollars, he explained. It wants something else. What does it want, Stephanie asked. And Warren said, wants to provision itself. The tax isn't there to raise money. It's there to get people working and produce things for the government. And she goes on with the explanation of that. It's all very commonsensical. It's extremely well written. Uh, it was hard for her to grasp Her head spun, she says. And then she says, then he told me a story. Story about how Warren got his kids to do housework. He got them to work for his business cards. He figured out the kids did not need his cards. So he told them he wasn't going to require them to do any work at all. All he wanted was a payment of 30 of his business cars each month. He told them failure to pay would result in a loss of privileges. No more TV use of the swimming pool or trips to the mall. Stephanie said it was a stroke of genius. He'd imposed a tax that could only be paid using his own particular monogrammed uh, paper, now the cards were worth something. And then the kids within hours were scurrying around doing their household chores. 
Each time the kids did some work, they got a receipt, some business cards. At the end of the month, they returned the cards to their father. As Warren explained, he didn't actually need to collect his own cards back from the kids. And he said, oh, what would I want with my own tokens? He got what he wanted out of the deal. He got a tidy house. But he did take the cards back. Because he wanted them to keep earning cards every month. He had invented a virtuous provisioning system. So, and he taught some basic principles. Taxes are there to create a demand for the currency. The government can define the currency in terms of its own unique unit of account, a dollar a yen, a pound a peso, a business card. As Warren said, quote, taxes turn litter into currency, unquote. And Stephanie went on with the narrative why a tax liability is important, but not for raising revenues. On the other hand, if you do invoke a tax, uh, you cannot tax until the government first supplies its tokens. Until the government first spends, taxes cannot be collected. So, of course, taxpayers weren't funding the government. The government was funding the taxpayers. And Stephanie thought about this in terms of the monopoly game, where, of course, there's a bank and the bank never goes broke. The banker may issue as much money as may be needed by writing on any ordinary paper. Oh, I'm sorry. It was the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, whose name I forgot. And she asked people to get a tour of the engraving, printing, okay, the Bureau okay, of Engraving, okay, and Printing. Only you can't take photos. <laughs> There's a big sign there. It's an enormous neon sign that reads, we make the money the old-fashioned way. We print it. When you go through it, someone's going to say, I wish I could do that. <laughs> and she points out that the U.S. Mint issues the legal tender coinage, that the Federal Reserve issues the digital dollars known as bank reserves, and makes the point these are created exclusively via keystrokes on a computer controlled by the government's fiscal agent, the Federal Reserve. And then she uses the analogy of the scorekeeper assigning points in a game of bridge, or in a game of soccer, or in a game of softball, or in baseball. The scorekeeper can issue the points. The points are like the dollars. That was Warren's analogy, too. Warren was great at coming up, is great at coming up with analogies. Then she shifts to the military budget in 2019. $716 billion was approved, nearly $80 billion more than Congress had authorized in fiscal year 2018. There was no debate about how to pay for the spending. No one asked, where will we get the extra $80 billion? Lawmakers didn't raise taxes, so go out and borrow an extra $80 billion from savers. Instead, Congress committed to spending the money it did not have. It can do that because of its special power over the U.S. dollar. Once Congress authorizes the spending, agencies like the Department of Defense are given permission to enter into contracts with companies like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and so on. 
order to provision itself with F-35 fighters. The U.S. Treasury instructs its bank, the Federal Reserve, carry out the payment on its behalf. The Fed does this by marking up the numbers in Lockheed's bank account. Actually, it, right, it is the Fed that does that. <coughs> The important point, Congress doesn't need to find the money to spend. It needs to find the votes. It can authorize the spending. The rest is just accounting. As the checks go out, the Fed clears the payments by crediting the seller's account with the appropriate number of digital dollars known as bank reserves. That's why MMT sometimes describes the Fed as the scorekeeper for the dollar. Scorekeeper can't run out of points. And then we go further with that. Stephanie proceeds to continue to make these points about where money comes from. And she uses the scorekeeper analogy again and again, and then points out only the scorekeeper is different with the government. Uncle Sam doesn't need dollars. When he collects taxes from us, he's just subtracting away some of our dollars. He doesn't actually get any dollars. He says, it's jarring, I know. This is our first Copernican moment. It's why one journalist, the Financial Times, described um, um, MMT is an auto stereogram, you know, one of those two dimensional images that doesn't look like much until you focus your gaze a certain way. Then the image behind the image comes into view, revealing an intricate 3D visual of a painted desert or a great white shark. Once you're able to see the government's ability to spend doesn't revolve around the taxpayer dollar, the whole fiscal paradigm shifts, or as that journalist put it, quote, once you get it. You never see things quite the same way again, unquote. But then the question arises, why bother taxing and borrowing? And little Amy from Bristol called the planet money and asked, why not just print? Why tax? And the host of the podcasts were intrigued and they reached out to Stephanie with the following question. The government couldn't create money, so what's the point of taxes? I told the folks at Planet Money that MMT recognizes at least four important reasons for taxing. We've already touched on the first, you know, create a demand for the currency. Uh and then she points out, Amy touches on the reason, second important reason for taxation, inflation. That is, you've got to tax away some of the money or you're going to have inflation. And she goes into some detail on this, but also points out that raising taxes when it's not necessary can undermine fiscal stimulus, and raising the wrong kinds of taxes can leave a nation vulnerable to accelerating inflation. And postpones consideration of that until Chapter 2. Uh, and she talks about other purposes of taxation and new forms of taxation. Talks about sin taxes and a proper distribution, okay, of income. Then moves to the role of borrowing, okay, in MMT. And then she talks about her own writing and her article, Do Taxes and Bonds Finance Government Spending? As she began to write after she'd done her research, she didn't know where she would arrive. She said, I was committed to letting the research be my guide. 1998, she published an early draft of the paper, and two years later, a more polished version in an academic uh, publication. The answer to the question she had posed was no taxes and bonds, don't finance government spending. <clears throat> 
and she says, to the naked eye, it can appear the government is collecting dollars from taxpayers and bond buyers because it needs those dollars to pay its bills. You, this way, the purpose of taxes and bonds is to finance government. That's how Thatcher wanted us to see it through the lens of a household. MMT looks at what's happening through the lens of the currency issue. The government doesn't need our money. The purpose of taxing and borrowing isn't to raise dollars for Uncle Sam. Then why does the government need to borrow? The answer is it doesn't. It chooses to offer people a different kind of government money that pays a bit of interest. In other words, U.S. treasuries are just interest-bearing dollars. And she suggests we might call the interest-bearing dollars a yellow dollars and the regular currency green dollars. She says, when the government spends more than the taxes away from us, we say the government has run a fiscal deficit. That deficit increases the supply of green dollars. That's a very important statement. She points out the reason why we borrow money is because we don't have it and we want to buy something. But unlike a household, the government spends first, supplying the dollars that can then be used to buy government bonds. As we'll see in Chapter 3, she points out, it does this to support interest rates, not to fund spending. In her section on staying within the limits, she says, to get where we need to go, we have to break three, free of Thatcher's dictum. That means shedding the myth that the government has no money of its own, that it must ultimately get the money it needs from us, the taxpayer. And that we cannot run out of money, as President Obama once claimed. She asked the question, does that mean there are no limits? Can we just print our way to prosperity? Absolutely not. MMT is not a free lunch. There are very real limits. It may seem like Congress is already spending without limits. We're on track to have $28 trillion worth of debt by 2029. In many ways, it looks like there's nothing holding Congress back, but technically there is. First of all, Congress has imposed its own constraints. The pay grow constraint on the Senate side, there's the Byrd rule. Under the Byrd rule, deficits can increase, but they can't continue to rise beyond the 10 year budget window. So if CBO does a projection and finds that under a particular bill, uh, the deficits are continuing to rise beyond the 10-year budget window, then that's a problem, according to the Byrd rule. It's not allowed for the Senate to pass it. Of course, the Senate can always overcome the Byrd rule itself because it's its own rule. The House can always overcome the PAYGO rule because it's also its own rule. The House and Senate uh require themselves to seek a budget score from agencies like the cbo or the joint committee on taxation uh, but as i said all these constraints can be waived or suspended by congress and they do that all the time when they really want to get something done so these constraints are just excuses So she asked, why not eliminate the pay-go, pay -go, the bird rule, the debt limit statute, and other self-imposed checks on government spending? Why not stop pretending Congress needs a budget like a household? Truth is, many lawmakers find the constraints politically useful. Members of Congress routinely face pressure from voters seeking more generous funding for health care, education, and so on. Budget rules give them political cover. 
and she asks, if they could hide behind the deficit myth, what excuse would they use to justify withholding support? Helps to have a bad cop. And she goes back to the subject of our real limits. And she points out the real limits are inflation. That is a real danger. And she ends by saying, we're blessed to have enough of what matters. We can build an economy that provides a good life. We just need to budget our real resources. And she makes clear that there are no fiscal limitations, only the real limitation. In this case came inflation. Now, I don't know what you thought of that chapter, but I think it's a very, very clearly written chapter very simply written. It explains the limits. It explains uh, the currency power and the reasons why the government can never become insolvent. And then she moves on to inflation. And she says, think of inflation. And her myth number two is deficits are evidence of overspending. Her reality is evidence of overspending look to inflation and she talks about her experience in Washington and now Senator Enzi would often say deficits are evidence of overspending and how she almost jumped out of her chair at that and when she was uh, she was working for the budget committee she asks, what were they missing in Congress? She says three big things. First, the currency monopolist doesn't face the same constraints as currency users. Second, the government's budget isn't supposed to balance. What's supposed to balance, she offers, is our economy. The budget is just a tool that can be used to add or subtract the uh, dollars from the rest of us. The fiscal de deficit adds more dollars than it subtracts. The fiscal surplus subtracts more dollars than it adds. According to MMT, neither outcome is inherently good or bad. It's a balancing act. And what we're supposed to balance is the economy, not uh, the budget. She offers that the federal government has historically almost always kept its deficit too small. Yes, too small said the evidence of that is um, unemployment. She says MMT recognizes uh, that deficits can be too big, but Senator Enzi had it all wrong. A fiscal deficit is an evidence of overspending. For evidence of overspending, we must think of inflation. Then she goes over common ways of thinking about uh, inflation and she mentions the various price indices, different ways, okay, of looking at it. And then concludes, we can only get a general sense of what's happening to prices because it's literally impossible to track what's happening to the price of every item that's for sale in our um, economy. So she talks about the flaws of measurement when it comes to inflation and why people worry inflation that it can eat away at their real standard okay, of living. And she asks about the causes of inflation. But before she gets into those, she talks about the long battle against low inflation, which is considered a puzzle by many um, economists. They keep thinking inflation is a major danger. But uh, for decades, there are countries that have been trying to have a little bit of inflation. And they can't get it. They can't get it, and no matter how hard they try. Amazing. Uh, <coughs> she says, no one knows how long the current bout of low inflation will last. And then tells us economists typically distinguish between cost push and demand pull drivers of inflationary pressures. Cost push drivers include acts of God or acts of power, as when 
uh, there's a particular actor or a few actors that control prices in a market. They can create acts of power to raise prices that then spread through other areas of the economy, creating general inflation. She talks about how powerful storms could wipe out oil refineries, causing the price of energy to spike. And she talks about uh, demand pull drivers and says demand pull inflation occurs when businesses raise prices due to changes in buying habits. Most often it happens when people are spending faster than the economy can churn out new goods and services. If the government spends too much, it can create too much uh, money for people who then spend too fast, faster than the economy can churn out new goods and services. But she says every economy has its own internal speed limit and it can only produce so much at a given point in time. Uh, but it very often spends too little. And that's why the 787 billion fiscal stimulus passed in 2009 didn't cause an inflation problem. It was spending too little. There was too much slack, okay, in the economy. It could easily absorb the 787 billion. Steph then turns to monetarism and Milton Friedman and his claim that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And she explains how Friedman, okay, was reasoning and the basis for monetarism, okay, and monetary policy uh, controlled by the Federal Reserve. She talks about the natural rate okay, of unemployment, explains it and questions whether there really is a natural rate okay, of unemployment. Talks about how the Fed fights inflation today Talks about uh, the dual mandate the Fed has to contain inflation and to fight uh, on, uh, unemployment. Okay, but says, since the Fed doesn't have any fiscal authority, how is it supposed to deliver on its dual mandate? Then she talks about the inability of the Fed to control the money supply which it was originally thought it could control. And that's what made people think it could take contain uh, inflation. And Steph asks, why did conservative economists such as uh, Mr. Goodfriend, okay, Professor Goodfriend, why did he get it so wrong? One problem is that the natural rate of unemployment, if it exists at all, isn't something the Fed can observe or even calculate. <laughs> it's more like a description of an economy in its ideal state. And she talks about the non-accelerating inflationary rate of unemployment. Okay, the NIRU explains what it is explains why it's very hard to know it before the fact. Therefore, it's very hard to use it okay, in planning. It says we do not directly observe the Nairu. Rather, we only infer it from the response of wage compensation and price inflation as the labor market uh, tightens. In other words, the Fed watches the labor market for evidence that wages might be accelerating and interprets rising pay as a prelude to um, inflation. Unfortunately, things haven't uh, worked that way because the Fed always seems to tighten before it has to tighten. It always assumes it's reached the natural rate okay, of unemployment when it has not uh, done so. How do we know? Because unemployment keeps on going lower. 
And it's always a surprise to the Fed. And then she gives a story about how Chairman Powell got questioned by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And he had to admit, he had to agree the Fed's estimate of the lowest sustainable unemployment rate has been too high. And Powell agreed. He said, absolutely. So they admitted error. But they would not admit that there was no such thing as the Nairu, that they did not need the, the Nairu. But they did confess that the Fed has no reliable theory of inflation guiding its day-to-day -day decision making. And so Stephanie contests uh, the faith of the Fed's people, contests their faith that the economy works in the way they think contests their faith that there is such a thing as a Nairo. And she asks, why not just strive for a better mix of fiscal and monetary policy to keep the economy operating at its full employment potential? Couldn't we achieve true full employment by asking the Fed to improve the way it runs monetary policy? Or maybe Congress could help fine tune the economy with better real-time adjustments in government spending and taxation. Anyway, after arguing against uh, the approach of the Fed and pointing out okay, its failures, uh, she says, others take the opposite approach, pointing to recent evidence that lower unemployment hasn't come at the cost of rising um, inflation and that the Fed can do more to increase the availability of jobs. Uh, and she points out even Stephen Moore one of Trump's economists has complained that the Fed has unnecessarily stomped on the brake pedal before it had to, before the unemployment rate had gotten as low as it possibly could have gotten. And then Stephanie points out, okay, that MMT takes a different attitude Uh, that rather than waiting around for the market okay, to determine what the natural rate okay, of unemployment is, uh, that and then MMT has a different way, and that its way is to provide full employment through a policy known as the job guarantee, not to worry about the Nairu uh, at all. MMT economists say the federal budget might be in deficit, but we're underspending whenever there is unused capacity. And then she talks about um, Abba Lerner's functional finance approach to fiscal policy. And she writes approvingly of it, but, uh, and shows a graphic of how you ought to redefine a balanced budget. Not um, um, define it by whether government spending and taxes are in balance but whether full employment and price stability are in balance. And she says, learners' insights are important to MMT, but they don't go far enough. 
We agree we should rely on adjustments in taxes and spending rather than interest rates to balance our economy. We also agree that fiscal deficits in and of themselves are neither good nor bad. What matters is not whether the government's budget is in surplus or deficit, that whether government is using its budget to achieve good outcomes for the rest of the economy. And she says, even if all 535 members of Congress woke up tomorrow and agreed to conduct fiscal policy the way Lerner recommended, involuntary unemployment would remain a permanent feature of our economy. And that there was only one way to stop that. There is only one way to stop that. Okay, and that is you need a powerful new shock absorber, a powerful new automatic stabilizer in the form of a federal job guarantee. She says, here's how it would work. The federal government announces a wage and benefit package for anyone looking for work but unable to find suitable employment in the economy. And she points out several MMT economists have recommended the job be oriented around building a care economy. Uh, some are pointing out, okay, at this point that it should be, uh, it should be built around a care economy and a green economy, care jobs and green jobs. Then very generally, that means the federal government would commit to funding jobs aimed at caring for our people, our communities, and our planet. This effectively establishes a public option in the labor market for the government fixing an hourly wage and allowing the quantity of workers hired into the program to float. Since the market price of an unemployed worker is zero, that is no one is currently bidding on them, the government can create a market for these workers by setting the price it is willing to pay to hire them. Once it does, involuntary unemployment disappears. Anyone seeking paid employment has guaranteed access to a job at a rate established by the federal government. She talks about the origins of the job guarantee idea in Franklin Roosevelt and mentions other historical figures who advocated for it. <clears throat> Asked, why does the financing have to come from Uncle Sam? She says, simple, he can't run out of money. He can allow the budget for the job guarantee to operate counter-cyclically. No city, no state is capable okay, of doing that. She says, with the job guarantee in place, the economy can pass through a rough patch without throwing millions of people into unemployment. She says, the rough patches are inevitable. There isn't a capitalist economy on earth that has found a way to eradicate the business cycle. Economies grow and create jobs, and then eventually something happens to throw them into recession. And she talks about the major benefits of the job guarantee, how it smooths out the cycles. And she talks about how, okay, it works in an automatic way, how the jobs would be defined by the local communities, and how MMT fights involuntary unemployment by eliminating it. You know, I view the most effective full employment policy is one that targets the unemployed directly. Don't aim spending at infrastructure and hope that's going to trickle down. Don't aim it at anything else and hope that's going to trickle down. Just aim the spending at creating jobs. It's not a make-work scheme. It's a way to enhance the public good while strengthening our communities through a system of shared uh, governance. Says if the economy would have crashed in the way it did in 2008 or the way it's crashing now, the federal job guarantee would catch hundreds of thousands of people instead of allowing them to fall into unemployment. It would have caught millions of people this time instead of allowing them to fall into unemployment. It would probably have caught more than 30 million people this time if we had had a federal job guarantee program in effect. MMTers have been proposing this program for literally decades now and most vigorously 
since 2009. But nobody listened. Nobody listened. Here we go. So she writes about the job guarantee. She proposes, say, $15 per hour. The real idea is that it be a living wage, which, as we know, can be more than $15 an hour. She points out that by anchoring the price of labor, the job guarantee imparts greater stability across the spectrum of wages and prices in the economy. And she points out also, it helps to fight inflationary pressure by maintaining a ready pool of employed people from which businesses can easily hire when businesses are looking to expand production. And she talks about how employers prefer to hire people who are employed and who are used to working, having lost their work habits. And she quotes Spider-Man again, quote, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. She says Senator Enzi was right to express concerns about overspending, but he failed, failed to identify the real danger. Threat to our common well-being isn't the budget deficit, it's excessive inflation. She points out members of Congress only ask whether new spending will increase the deficit, not inflation. She says that's the wrong question. In fact, as MMT shows, it sidesteps the great responsibility that should be demanded of any government that wields the power of the fiscal purse. She says, suppose Congress wants to spend $2 trillion modernizing and upgrading America's crumbling infrastructure airports, hospitals, highways, bridges, water treatment facilities, etc. Because no one in Congress thinks like a currency issuer. They all believe the important thing to worry about is whether the spending will increase the deficit. To avoid adding to the deficit, suppose they pair the spending with a proposal to raise $2 trillion by leveling a small tax on a handful of Americans whose net worth exceeds $50 million. Today, that bill would go to the CBO, where it would likely receive a good score, on the grounds that it doesn't add to the deficit over time. With a green light from CBO, members of Congress would be free to move forward with a vote to authorize the spending. What happens next could be a disaster. As the Department of Transportation tries to contract out the work, it quickly discovers there aren't enough unemployed resources available for government to hire. That's because the tax fell on a small number of people who weren't going to spend much of that money in the first place. It should not be construed as an argument against taxing the rich. It's an argument against arbitrary decision-making when it comes to tax policy. There's a strong case to be made for taxing the rich, and we need to do it, but we need to do it strategically, recognizing the purpose of the tax is not to pay for government spending, but to help us rebalance the distribution of wealth and income because the extreme concentrations that exist uh, today are a threat to both our democracy and to the functioning of our um, economy. Then she goes into Jeff Bezos an example and points out that billionaires save their wealth in the form of financial assets, real estate, fine art, and rare coins. A wealth tax might make the infrastructure bill appear fiscally responsible, but it makes a lousy offset if the government wants to increase spending in an economy that doesn't have much available slack. In a deeply depressed economy, this wouldn't matter. There would be plenty of fiscal space. But as we get close to full employment, these real resources become increasingly scarce. Once the economy exhausts its real productive capacity, the only way for the government to get the construction workers, architects, engineers, steel, concrete, paving trucks, cranes, and so on, that it needs to bid them away from the current use. That bidding process pushes prices higher, giving rise to inflationary pressures. To mitigate that risk, the tax needs to offset enough current spending to free up the real resources the government is trying to hire. That doesn't make it a bad idea on other grounds. It just means it's not an effective way to mitigate inflation risk, and that's especially important. That's why MMT recommends, and this is the key idea, a different approach to the federal budgeting process. 
one that integrates inflation risk into the decision-making process so lawmakers are forced to stop and think about whether they've taken the necessary steps to guard against inflation risk before approving any new spending. MNT would make us safer in this respect because it recognizes the best defense against inflation is a good offense. We don't want to allow excessive spending to cause inflation and then fight inflation after it happens. We want agencies like the CBO helping to evaluate new legislation for potential inflation risk before Congress commits to funding new programs so that risk can be mitigated preemptively. At its core, MMT is about replacing an artificial revenue constraint with a real inflation constraint. That's such an important idea, and it's highlighted well by Stephanie here. <clears throat> She points out, MMT's way turns PAYGO on its head. Instead of accepting the presumption that we should always avoid adding to the deficit, MMT tells us to start by asking whether any of the proposed spending needs to be offset to mitigate inflation risk. Sticking with the $2 trillion infrastructure proposal, MMT could have, have us begin by asking if it would be safe for Congress to authorize $2 trillion in new spending without offsets. A careful analysis of the economy's existing and anticipated slack would guide lawmakers in making that um, 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 determination. If the CBO and other independent analysts concluded it would risk pushing inflation above some desired inflation rate, then lawmakers could begin to assemble a menu of options to identify the most effective way to mitigate ways to mitigate that risk. Perhaps one third, one half, or three parts of the spending would need to be offset. It's also possible none would require offsets, as in taxes or as in selling debt instruments. Or perhaps the economy is so close to its full employment potential that pay go is the right policy. The point is, Congress should work backward to arrive at the answer rather than beginning with the presumption. that every new dollar of spending needs to be fully offset. That helps to protect us from unwarranted tax increases and undesired inflation. It also ensures there's always a check on any new spending. The best way to fight inflation is before it happens. And Stephanie goes on with this, talking about the power of public purse and real fiscal responsibility that overspending is an abuse of power, but so is refusing to act when more can be done to elevate the human condition without risking inflation. And that's chapter two. So again, we have a simple chapter. Stories are in the chapter where there need to be story. The language is not full of jargon. The language is commonsensical, and the language is targeting at explaining to people what causes inflation, how to adjust the budget process so that inflation finally is taken account of as a real thing, not by proxy somehow, by simply assuming that if we balance budget, uh, we're not going to um, have inflation and maybe we'll still be able to get to full employment somehow. Chapter three, the national debt, that isn't. Myth number three, one way or another, we're all on the hook. The national debt poses no financial burden whatsoever is the reality. Why not? Because what is the debt actually? What is it? It's only yellow dollars. It's only yellow dollars to be spent in the future, traded for green dollars now, and the yellow dollars are interest-bearing dollars. 
which the government will spend at some time in the future, giving people an income at some time in the future. It has no problem giving them that income because it's a currency sovereign that can meet any of its uh, obligations. Stephanie talks about her experiences in Washington and how frustrating it was and how bad their reasoning was uh, when it came to the debt. She explains how people get so frozen because the debt is so big. How the numbers are so big so that they freeze people. Uh, she points out bookstores are replete with bombastic titles featuring anxiety-inspiring words like endgame, red ink, and fiscal therapy. Well, uh, one title for one of my books is Fixing the Debt Without Breaking America. Now, that was a bombastic title. Of course, it was an MMT book. I used a bombastic title because I wanted people to get uh, the book. Too few of them read it anyway. It was hot for a while, but then quickly went away as soon as the government was no longer considering doing platinum coins. Anyway, there's this huge debt clock on West 43rd Street. It actually displays a historical record of how many dollars the federal government has added to people's po pockets without subtracting them away. Those dollars are being saved in the form of U.S. Treasuries. If you're lucky enough to own some, congratulations. They're part of your wealth. While others may refer to it as a debt clock, it's really a U.S. dollar savings clock. But you won't hear that from anyone in Congress. So that's a different meme. The debt clock is a saving clock. Think of it. Think about it as a savings clock. Think of the Treasury instruments, okay, the U.S. Treasuries, as yellow dollars. But as dollars, as dollars, it's more true that they're yellow dollars than it is that they are debts of the government. Of course, the government has to redeem the yellow dollars at some future time. But it's not like the kind of situation where you have to pay a debt. You have to pay a debt to people at some future time uh, in essentially by giving them yellow dollars because you have to get, well, they're green dollars, but they also contain interest. So you signed a note to the bank or to the entity you borrowed money from and your note is your giving of your yellow dollars um, to the other party. But you have to pay it back in green dollars that you don't issue, that you have to get. For the government, it's a different thing because they issue those green dollars. The Federal Reserve issues those green dollars. But the way we now talk, okay, of U.S. Treasuries, which are nothing more than those yellow interest um, uh, bearing dollars. For some of the politicians, attaching the word debt to a really big number creates the perfect foil. It's megonomophobia, the fear, fear of large numbers. That might not be a medically recognized anxiety disorder, but plenty of politicians seem to think it's real enough. And she talks about how Mike Enzi wanted to dramatize the numbers by writing them in the long form with all the zeros in back of the one one zero 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 zero. Right. Okay. That's because Enzi ran a shoe business, and he was very <laughs> he was very persuaded by very very large numbers with lots of zeros in back of them. 
And Stephanie says, MMT shows we don't need to fix the debt. We need to fix our thinking, not just to prevent senseless cuts, the program that supports tens of millions, but also to have a more enlightened, enlightened uh, debate. And she moves on to talk about China, Greece, and Bernie Madoff, and how they're different from the United States as the currency issuer, and how China never issued any of our dollars, and how we don't have to fret over the possibility they might one day shut off the spigot, starve the U.S. of the dollars we need to pay our bills. She says, heck, I don't even think we should be referring to the sale of treasuries as borrowing or labeling the securities themselves as national debt. Just confuses the issue and causes people unnecessary grief. Even worse, misguided fears stand in the way of better public policy. And that hurts all of us, so let's try to fix our thinking. And he, she talks about how Obama told America that we were relying on a credit card from the Bank of China in order to make us anxious about it. And Stephanie points out, uh, where did China get the 1.11 trillion in U.S. treasuries it held as of May 2019? Did Uncle Sam travel to Beijing, star spangled hat in hand, to ask the Chinese government for a loan? Not at all. What happens first is China decides it wants to sell some of what it produces to buyers outside of China, including the U.S. And then Stephanie goes along and explains how uh, those payments are credited to China's bank account at the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Like any other holder of U.S. dollars, China has the option to sit on those dollars or use them to buy something else. Uncle Sam doesn't pay interest on the dollars China keeps in his checking account at the Fed. Uh, that's not quite true. Actually, the Fed does pay interest on reserves at this point, but uh, the rate is less than uh, would be um, on offer for Treasury securities. So China usually prefers to move them into what is effectively a savings account at the Fed. It does this by purchasing U.S. treasuries. Borrowing from China involves nothing more than an accounting adjustment whereby the Federal Reserve subtracts numbers for China's reserve account, its checking account, and adds numbers to its securities account, its savings account. First heard this from, uh, from Warren Mosler. It's just so striking. And again, she uses the yellow dollars versus green dollars thing to try to make clear. It's nothing, folks. It's just some accounting at the Federal Reserve. Those dollars don't originate from China. They're coming from the United States. We're not really borrowing from China so much as we're supplying China with dollars and then not allowing those dollars to be transformed into a U.S. Treasury security that carries interest. There's no national credit card. In terms like borrowing or misleading, so is labeling those securities the national debt. There's no real debt obligation. As Warren Mosul likes to put it, the only thing we owe China is a bank statement, quote unquote. And she says, the worry is that Uncle Sam could lose access to affordable financing if China refuses to keep buying treasuries. There are a number of problems with this thinking. For one thing, China can't avoid holding dollar assets without wiping out its trade surplus with the United States, which is not something China wants to do. As financial commentator and former investment banker Edward Harrison put it, the only question for China is which dollar assets, green dollars or yellow dollars, it will buy, not whether it will go on a U.S. dollar strike, unquote. The green dollars or yellow dollars there is an insert of Stephanie's into that quote. And even if it does decide to hold fewer U.S. treasuries in its portfolio, this situation won't leave Uncle Sam Strat for crash. Remember, the U.S. is a currency issue, which means it can never run out of dollars. Moreover, as Mark Chandler, po popular television commentator and author of the book Making Sense of the Dollar, observed, 
China reduced its holdings of U.S. treasuries by 15% from 2016 through November 2016, and the 10-year treasury yield was virtually unchanged. Stephanie then contrasts that situation with the Greek government and why Greece was having such trouble. This talks a little about the TABS model. Uh, and then she moves into the problems Greece had with the uh, the Eurozone and the credit, uh, credit rating agencies downgrading Greek bonds. And that when they downgraded our government bonds, nothing happened. <laughs> and Stephanie points out that Greece had some problems because it was not a currency issuer. And she reviews STAB again why the STAB model is the one that applies for the United States. She says, since our lawmakers have not yet had the benefit of seeing MMT's insights, they view debt service as a growing financial burden on the federal government. So again, all of this is very simply written. Uh, There is no limit to our capacity to spend, except the impacts, the effects that excessive spending would have. We have to attend to those real uh, limits, the inflation limits, but we don't have to attend to the so-called financial limits that only exist because Congress has tied itself in knots with its pay-go and its debt limit and uh, its bird rule, okay, and other things like that. We don't have any monetary limits. We have real spending limits, and we have to plan for those. And there's, are there are distributional implications of uh, inflation that we have to avoid. And she talks about how some people complain we shouldn't be paying interest at all. They see treasuries as a kind pay of luxury good. Uh, I don't like treasuries myself, actually. Uh, and she points out we could pay off our treasuries tomorrow. I don't advocate that, but I advocate paying them off as they fall due. But she explains it uh, very simply. Uh, she explains uh, importantly that the idea that the rest of us are personally liable for some portion of the national debt is preposterous. Um, I've written a couple of blogs about that, actually myself, in much more detail, explaining why it's a, um, um, it's a preposterous thing. She points up the ideas about uh, our debt that many economists still have and how they fail to recognize that okay, it's really not debt, how they have liberalized in their views of it, but they still don't look at it through the MMT lens. And she contrasts the work of Scott um, Fulweiler, the MMT economist, uh, with that okay, of... Uh, the international banker Olivier Blanchard, a uh, former, I think he's former head of the World Bank or the IMF, she mentions here. I just went by it. So Stephanie basically contends that if we paid off the whole debt now, it would not have an inflationary impact on the economy, or at least a very great uh, inflationary impact on the uh, economy. 
since if we paid it off now, though, we'd have to pay off the interest also. Uh, we don't know for sure about whether it would have something of an inflationary impact. We know in the future it won't have an inflationary impact. Okay, or very much of one. Uh, but anyway, her arguments are okay, pretty good. I certainly can't say they're wrong. Uh, she's not advocating that we pay it all off. But of course, what she's advocating is basically the idea, well, since we can pay it off tomorrow, it's not really a problem for us. It's, it's never really a problem for us. Uh, she talks about how the, uh, the, uh, the Federal Reserve was able to control interest rates completely as it wanted to in World War II. Uh, and she mentions the history and the Treasury Fed Accord of 1951. She talks about the problems uh, with the Japanese, but also their success in determining uh, the rate for their long-term government bonds, keeping those rates near for 10 years, uh, near zero. She says, so while Japan is often described as the most indebted country in the world, half of its debt has already been essentially retired by its central bank. Its central bank bought half its debt. And it could easily go, the central bank could, all the way to 100%. If it did, Japan would become the least indebted developed country in the world overnight. <laughs> she says, MMT economists understand this, but not many others seem to realize how easy it would be for a country like Japan to pay off the entire public debt. So uh, this is uh, very good thinking. It's all very simply written. She cites the argument, okay, of Lonergan, that, uh, okay, if the wealth was unchanged and the debt was bought out uh, on tomorrow by the Japanese government and the people got uh, all this money, why would they run out and spend it? Why wouldn't they simply save it? Okay, and Lonergan argues they would. They would simply save it. And uh, uh, the whole thing would tend to push prices lower, not higher. Stephanie says, I would think twice about stripping the private sector of all of its interest-bearing bonds at once, but the Japanese government could certainly pull it off and the U.S. could do it too. She says, just think of it. No more government shutdowns as lawmakers engage in theatrical uprising over raising the debt ceiling limit. No one comparing Uncle Sam to a spendthrift who's running up the credit card and borrowing from China. No fear of losing access to the bond market. And so uh, I really think this chapter is beautifully constructed okay, and beautifully argued. As I said, I don't completely agree with all of it, but it's great. Okay, it's wonderful. It will do a lot to get people off of the debt nonsense it will do an awful lot to get people to see the sense okay, of MMT and to listen to um, 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 economists who are MMT trained and who base their policies okay, on MMT. She goes into the Clinton record, 
And she says, if we're not going to eliminate treasuries, we have to find a way to make peace with the national debt. Perhaps we should start by just giving it another name. She said, it's nothing like a household debt. So using the word debt just leads to confusion and unnecessary angst. We could just refer to it as part of our net money supply. She says, I doubt, okay, yellow dollars will catch on, but hey, it's worth a shot. Maybe we should make them rainbow dollars. Maybe that would work better. In Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, um, but Juliet famously inquires, what's in a name, quote unquote? She wasn't uh, troubled when she learned that, uh, that Romeo uh, was Montague. For her, quote, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, unquote. Love, as they say, is blind. On the political stage, words matter. However, it, she didn't say however, but however, it's time to come up with a new name for those interest-bearing dollars. And she did. Yellow dollars. I think yellow dollars is perfectly all right. But if someone prefers uh, rainbow dollars, I'm up for that also. I think J.D. Alt suggested uh, future dollars, didn't he? Something like that. Anyway, their ink is our blank ink. So myth number four, government deficits crowd out private investment, um, that, which makes us poor. This is a myth which is very important uh, for the government, particularly for CBO, that really relies on this myth. It's um, Stephanie's reality. It's fiscal deficits increase our wealth and collective savings. They don't decrease our wealth and collective savings. They don't crowd out uh, anything because the spending comes first. And she goes through this chapter pointing out that they can't possibly crowd out um, the statements that she points out there's a professional class of budget wants academics in Washington who treat this as an article of faith. And she points to a bunch of um, if then statements okay, that are presented like a mathematical series of rigorously tested if then statements. If deficits require more borrowing, then the supply of savings available to finance private investment is reduced. If the supply of savings is reduced, then interest rates will rise. If interest rates rise, then private investment will decline. If private investment um, declines, then the economy will grow more slowly over time. Tap the first domino and the rest obediently follow. The problem with it is that it's all based on the TABS model. Based on the TABS model. Uh, it may be the conventional wisdom, but it's based on the TABS model. She asks us to imagine two buckets. One is Uncle Sam's bucket, and the other is a collective bucket in the name of everyone who is not Uncle Sam, the non-government. Okay. And then she talks about uh, sectoral balances and Wynne Godley and sitting in Wynne's office and learning about the sectoral balances. She talks about uh, Wynne Godley, the Renaissance man, and his pretty sophisticated models, but he wants us to attend to the one equation model of the world. The equation looks like this. Government financial balance plus non-government financial balance is equal to zero. And she says, that's not a theory. That is an accounting identity that will always produce an accurate statement of fact. Actually, it doesn't produce an accurate statement of fact. It produces an accurate statement okay, of logic. that if you divide all the flows into two and tote up the government financial balance, 
um, the balance and the non-government um, financial balance, uh, then that has to be equal to zero. Uh, that's not an accurate statement of fact. It's an accurate statement of the logical conclusion. She says you can think of it as a twist on Isaac Newton's third law of motion, which states for every action there is an equal and opposite um, a reaction. She says in the Garvey model, we can see that for every deficit that exists in one part of the economy, there is an equal and opposite surplus in some other part. There's just no way around it. In this case, there's no way around it because of the logic of the situation. You take a pie, you know, you divide it in half. And if if something from one half goes to something of the other half, then uh, the half it's come from is minus. The half it goes to uh, is plus. If you add the two halves together, and the minuses and the pluses are going to cancel out, it's still going to be equal to zero. So she teaches us that she teaches that a government deficit equals a non-government um, a surplus. And she points out that is a very, very powerful observation and one that deals a fatal blow to the simple crowding out story. Because if the government runs a deficit, then there's more money in the private sector for investment purposes, not less money. There always has to be more money if there's a government deficit. And exhibit three shows that. It shows us that Uncle Sam's red ink is our black ink. And I think calling it Uncle Sam's red ink is our black ink and illustrating it um, as an equation and illustrating it as buckets all makes it very easy for people to understand. And he uses the bathtub analogy or she uses okay, the bathtub analogy, which is a very good analogy to use in this instance. And she shows that when there's a balanced budget, spending exactly equals taxes. That's what happens when uh, you run things on a pay-go basis. And it's possible that's a good outcome. But uh, okay, that may not be a good outcome. It may not be an outcome that leads to full employment and price uh, stability. On the other hand, if we have that kind of income, then why does it matter whether the budget is balanced? If we have a good outcome and the good outcome comes about as a result of running it, having a government deficit of 20% and a private sector surplus of 20%, well, that's fine. Who cares? Especially since the government is a monetary sovereign and can never run out of money. Who cares? So she goes on to explain more about the sectoral financial balances. And she gets to the point where she complexifies things a little and points out, well, she hasn't quite done it yet. First, she goes to the interest rate and she points out the crowding out story is rooted in the tabs model where Uncle Sam is a currency user who has to finance his expenditures either by taxing or borrowing. Uh, in that kind of situation, there can be crowding out. The financial crowding out story asks us to imagine that there's a fixed supply of savings from which anyone can attempt to, to borrow. 
when MMT rejects the loanable fund story, which is the story based on the TAB's model. It's rooted in the idea that borrowing is limited by access to scarce financial resources. As Scott Fulweiler put it, the conventional analysis is simply inconsistent with how the modern financial system actually works. Since MMT recognizes the federal government doesn't operate its budget like a household, we reject the TABS model and use the currency issuer's STAB model instead. Since the government can spend first, and then tax and borrow, uh, let's again assume $90 is used to pay taxes. As Exhibit 6 shows, the government's deficit deposits $10 into the non-government bucket. And then she illustrates that if the government simply left us holding green dollars, it could run a fiscal deficit without selling the government bonds that end up adding the thing we unfortunately call national debt. But that's not the way things work. Under current arrangements, the government sells treasuries whenever it runs a fiscal deficit. This is normally referred to as borrowing, but as we learned in Chapter 3, that is very much a misnomer. That's because the government's own deficit supplies the dollars that are needed to purchase the bonds. To match its $10 deficit with bond sale, the government simply puts 10 green dollars out of our bucket and recycles them into yellow dollars, into U.S. Treasuries. Exhibit 7 shows the government removing green dollars from the non-government bucket, replace, replacing them with interest-bearing bonds. When the whole process is over, Uncle Sam will have spent $100 into our bucket, tax $90 back out, and transformed the remaining 10 into yellow dollars called U.S. Treasury bonds. See, our yellow dollars does work. Would it have been better if she referred to them as rainbow dollars? I don't know. As Garvey's model reveals, government deficits always lead to a dollar-for-dollar dollar increase in the supply of net financial assets held in the non-government bucket. Then she says, that's not a theory. That's not an opinion. It's just the cold, hard reality of stock flow consistent accounting. It's just a logical conclusion, an inescapable logical conclusion. So fiscal deficits, even with government borrowing, can't leave behind a smaller supply of dollar savings. And if that can't happen, then a shrinking pool of dollar savings can't be responsible for driving borrowing costs higher. Clearly, this presents a problem for the conventional crowding out theory, which claims that government spending and private investment compete for a finite pool of savings. The reason the loanable fund story is not in sync with reality is that it asks us to treat the federal government like a currency user. But she says Uncle Sam is not a beggar who must go hat in hand in search of funding to support his desired spending. He's a muscular currency issuer. And she points out that's true of all monetary sovereigns. <clears throat> she points out that what matters most is the currency regime under which the current country is operating. Unlike Greece or Venezuela or Argentina, Countries with monetary sovereignty are not at the mercy of financial markets. MMT shows the U.S. government spends by crediting the reserve balances of private banks, which in turn credit the bank accounts of those receiving payments from the government. If you deposit a $1,000 check from Uncle Sam, your bank will get a $1,000 credit to its reserve account at the Federal Reserve and you will get a $1,000 credit to your own personal account. Payments made by you to the federal government have the opposite effect. In other words, she says, fiscal deficits increase the aggregate supply of reserve balances. What happens next, she says, depends entirely on the policy response 
the government might borrow, as it does today, replacing the newly created reserve balances with the U.S. Treasuries. Doing this allows the government to run fiscal deficits without altering the quantity of reserves in the banking system. From an MMT perspective, the purpose of selling bonds is not to finance government expenditures, which have already taken place, but to prevent a large infusion of reserves from pushing the overnight interest rate below the Fed's target level. Selling bonds is entirely voluntary in the sense that Congress could always decide to do things differently. She says it could even dispense with treasuries altogether, which would make it all but impossible for anyone to tell a crowding out story based on the argument that government borrowing is what drives interest rates higher. The point is deficits pose no inherent crowding out risk. The loanable funds theory is simply wrong. Fiscal deficits with or without bond sales do not mean an inevitable increase in interest rates. And Stephanie goes on under underlining her points um, on the further. She then explains the primary dealer system, which always ensures that all bond issues from the Treasury Department will always be bought by the 20 or so primary dealers that have a license to be primary dealers. She explains how there's no risk to being a primary dealer, that it's very profitable to be a primary dealer. So there's no problem in getting primary dealers to agree to be primary dealers. And she explains that in a very, very good way. I've explained it also myself in some blogs, but I haven't explained it in as much detail and as commonsensically and as well as she has explained it here. She's done a terrific job of reducing that. So, what's in this story, hidden in this story perhaps, is the big um, MMT truth that these days, when the federal government, when the treasury spends into the private sector, it always spends um, in the same way. That is, it orders the Federal Reserve to mark up um, 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 the accounts of uh, those private actors that it wants to send money to, that it wants to pay. And the Federal Reserve does that. And that is all there is to that particular transaction. Now, there might be a policy response coming after that, which involves issuing debt instruments. But as Stephanie has clearly illustrated here, that's a choice. It's a choice that doesn't have to be made by the federal government. But spending is always done the same way. So how are you going to pay for it is answered in the same way. Once you, Congress, appropriate the money for Medicare for all, once you appropriate the, the money for a green um, a new deal, then my Treasury Department, would someone like uh, Bernie Sanders say, uh, then my Treasury Department will spend the money as directed by Congress and the Federal Reserve acting as the fiscal agent of the Treasury Department will pay for whatever Congress has appropriated. That's how I'm going to pay for it. That's how I'm going to pay for it. I assure you that taxing won't be involved. 
Now, if my Congress, if the Congress that I work with wants to see to it that there's not too much money chasing too, um, but, um, but too few goods, perhaps causing inflation, uh, then the Congress I work with is going to have to tax enough or perhaps borrow enough to contain inflation. But that's not about paying for my program. That's about containing um, inflation. But how I'm going to pay for it is the same way we've been paying for it right along. It's the same way we're paying for military spending today. It's the same way we're paying for educational spending today. It's the same way we're paying for that part of medical spending that we pay for today. Okay, and even today, the federal government is footing $2.6 trillion per year worth okay, of medical spending, as calculated by some researchers. Uh, Uh, who are working at the City University of New York and who used to work at Harvard Medical School. <laughs> so, so Stephanie goes on. She talks about how the treasury works with the dealers, how the bond sales go on. She talks a lot about the banking details, the history, the treasury Fed Accord of 1951. It's all very commonsensical. It's all very factual. And she proves that the crowding out myth is just a myth. I don't think there's a single problem with that chapter. Then she moves to chapter five, which is winning a trade. And to myth number five, the trade deficit means um, but that America is losing. But she says, no, the reality, the trade deficit is the stuff surplus. Is it stuff? surplus. That is to say, it's the stuff surplus we get okay, from other nations. And the way she conveys that, the way she shows that, is by taking us through the sectoral balances again. After an introduction about Trump's silly nonsense about trade, and Richard Trumka's um, um, silly views okay, on trade. Oh, she agrees the trade deals are not good deals for labor and for many people here in this country and that they should be changed. But uh, the problem is not the trade deficits okay, that we're running. It's the other specifics in the trade deals. She's opposed to the free trade uh, regime we've signed up for. She's much more in favor of what looks like a fair trade uh, system. Certainly a collaborative trade system that's in the interest of both ourselves and other nations that we trade with. Far from the exploitive system we have now and the exploitive system that Trump is trying to create by modifying our current system. 
Stephanie says, rather than laying out a compelling plan to restore good paying jobs and help struggling communities, top Democrats simply gave up on many working class voters. And she mentions uh, Chuck Schumer's idea of losing blue collar voters in Western Pennsylvania and picking up two moderate Republicans in the suburbs in Philadelphia. What a great guy. He wants to pick up people who are moderate Republicans for the Democratic Party because he has no principles which the Democratic Party is supposed to fulfill. She says, the truth is a trade deficit is not in and of itself something to fear. We don't have to zero out our trade deficit to protect jobs and rebuild our communities. What we need to do is to use our fiscal capacity to maintain full employment um, at home. And then there's no reason to resort to a trade war. Instead, we can envision a new world trade order that works better, not for corporations seeking to exploit cheap labor and escape um, um, our, um, our regulations, but for millions of workers who've received such a raw deal under previous free trade policies in the post-NAFTA um, era. Re-envisioning trade also can lead to better, better policies for developing countries and for the global um, environment. Then she introduces the third bucket, the foreign sector, and goes back to Ngodley's sectoral financial balances. She points out that breaking up the non-government sector into the US private sector and the foreign sector still leaves the accounting identity, the three sectors still now still have to be equal to zero. Now there can just be transfers within the non-government sector between the private sector and the foreign sector. And she starts explaining this in simple dollar terms. Very simple for people to understand. And she begins to point out, okay, the danger, what happens if when the federal government runs a surplus, okay, or runs a deficit even, that more of that deficit goes to the foreign sector than goes to the private sector. And not just that, but that a sufficient amount uh, does not go to the private sector to compensate for the small size of the government deficit so that the private sector no longer has a surplus but falls into deficit and stephanie points out it did that during the late 90s and early 2000s but as godly warned she says that's usually an unsustainable situation because it involves the private sector tank taking on too much debt So she says, this is happening because U.S. runs persistent uh, trade deficits, a.k.a. stuff surpluses, which cause dollars to flow out of the private sector's bucket and into the foreign bucket. As long as that remains the case, only Uncle Sam can supply enough dollars to keep the private sector in surplus. To do that, the government must run budget deficits that exceed the trade deficit. And then she shows graphically in Exhibit 10 what happens if the government deficit becomes smaller than the trade deficit. Easy to understand. She says later, as soon as the government deficit gets bigger than the trade deficit, the private sector's financial balance will move back into surplus. So the question becomes, what do we want? Do we want a private sector surplus or do we want a private sector loss? If we want to hold down our budget deficit so that it's small enough, 
We can have a private sector loss, but we're very used to getting stuff from foreign traders, and we want to keep on getting much of that stuff. The cars we get, the televisions we get, the other consumer goods we get. Now, these days, lots of industrial goods that we get too. Do we want to keep on getting those things? If we do, we're going to have to run trade deficits. And if we want to have a private sector that is increasing its wealth over time, we're going to have to run governmental budget deficits. There is no other alternative. That is clear from the logic of the situation as described in the sectoral financial balances model. She points out that Trump's tariffs are really a tax on U.S. benefits. She says there are better ways to maintain a healthy balance in the private sector and better ways to protect American jobs. And then she gets into a section called no full employment and no fair trade. She says too often the U.S. doesn't just lose dollars to the rest of the world, it loses jobs too. And so she's argued one of the best answers to they took our jobs is um, um, everyone gets a job. And she pushes again for the federal job guarantee here. <clears throat> She talks about how the federal job guarantee would have mitigated the localized um, the devastation of communities that directly experienced the loss of well-paying U.S. industrial jobs. She points out with the job guarantee, free trade is no longer a threat to full employment and trade wars are no longer necessary to prevent um, unemployment. She points out trade negotiations can then focus on labor standards and environmental sustainability, with the U.S. using its market power to promote acceptable working conditions and environment standards worldwide, doing good things for everyone. Today, Chinese firms sell American households many environmentally unfriendly products. In addition, people all over the world currently endure unsafe, and unsanitary working conditions in order to provide America its stuff surplus. If we want to prioritize the well-being of workers worldwide, communities, and the planet as a whole, then we need a new approach to global trade. And that's what she advocates for here. She says we have to focus on the quality of trade. That's at least as important as the quantity of trade. What ends and whose interests are our trade relationships serving? Just like with fiscal policy, the big scary number that is the trade deficit is not worthy of so much attention. As MMT reminds us, real resources, real social needs, and real environmental benefits are what matters most when it comes to trade policy. At this point, it's important to understand a bit more about our trading partners about the world and the United States special privileges compared to other countries. And she begins to talk about that, the special position of our U.S. dollar and what it allows us to do. <clears throat> she talks about the gold standard and about Donald Trump's desire to wipe out the trade deficit would make far more sense if he was still on a gold standard. Then she talks about the Bretton Woods uh, system and Nixon going off the gold standard. And she circles back to, to monetary sovereignty and the idea that it's really a spectrum and that Governments have degrees, okay, of monetary sovereignty. 
And she points out that some nations have weakened okay, their monetary sovereignty by pegging their exchange rates to foreign currencies. And Bermuda, Venezuela, okay, and also Niger are mentioned here. She refers to all 19 countries in the Eurozone, countries that have borrowed heavily in US dollars or other foreign countries. And she talks about how this has compromised the monetary sovereignty of those nations, which can then struggle to repay loans in US dollars or other foreign currencies. She points out that by running trade deficits, we allow these countries to build up their dollar reserves so they can pay back loans to the IMF, which are um, um, in dollars. She says, in a very important sense, trade deficits are not optional. Much of the world simply must run trade surpluses with America. So she outlines that what we need is a collaborative trade of policies with other countries. We have to look to their interest as well as looking to our own and that we should be running our trade policies so as to encourage uh, the development of a high degree of monetary sovereignty okay, in other nations. She says, uh, like the U.S., other advanced nations float their currencies, meaning they don't try to value the currency to anything else. That way they don't have to defend the peg by buying, selling, or borrowing currencies they don't control. This is another reason they enjoy very high degrees of monetary sovereignty. It's not just a reason. It's part of enjoying a very high degree of monetary sovereignty. Uh, she talks about some other countries that are further down the spectrum, okay, of monetary sovereignty. And then she comes to the section, out of the Bretton Woods into the free trade fire. And she talks about the kinds of difficulties some of the developing nations have, such as Vietnam and Bangladesh or Ghana can't get out of the trap of providing the rest of the world with the, with manufacturing labor that's cheap or their natural resources like oil, metals, okay, or minerals. And she talks about said, trade relations that would allow them to develop stronger internal capabilities Okay, to be able to grow their own food, to have their own energy, and supply the medicines they need so they would not have to borrow from other countries to get uh, those things. She points out the problem is there isn't a robust permanent appetite for the financial assets or real estate okay, of developing countries that they lack deep um, capital markets. And so she envisions a trade policy that would help them to develop their monetary sovereignty and those capital markets and their ability to produce vital things for their economies so that their economies um, are sustainable. And that's what she means by winning okay, a trade. I think this chapter is also a very, very good one. It's very simply written. It presents a different point of view on trade. It presents a win-win point of view okay, on trade. Uh, and so I love this chapter okay, as well. My final section is goodbye, trade war, hello, trade peace, and the road to trade peace is to have the collaborative trading relationship 
and trading policies, okay, with other nations, and to uh, to facilitate the transition of other nations to monetary sovereignty, so that those nations can run their own job guarantee programs. She says, we cannot run domestic policy for the rest of the world's governments, but we can run the dominant currency in a way that makes global full employment something everyone could actually achieve. With decent jobs guaranteed for all, workers can engage in a public-led industrial policy aimed at producing sustainable infrastructure and a wider array of public services. And she goes on to talk, okay, of NAFTA and the faults, okay, with NAFTA in working with Mexico. So Mexico would not continue to be exploited by the United States. She points out that our trade agreements favor wealthy investors around the world while leaving workers, not to mention their environment, behind. And she comes out against investor state dispute uh, settlement mechanisms, for example, as she should and as all MMTers do. She says our free trade agreements expand the monetary sovereignty of rich countries at the expense of poor countries. She wants us to act as a global leader in informing these trade agreements by setting standards in the deals that we help to craft. It says we can demand strict ecological standards of our trading partners as well as robust um, the labor protections like a job guarantee geared toward helping poorer nations achieve food and energy sovereignty. We can insist that our trading partners share green technology and intellectual property with other countries in a way that truly lifts all boats. She wants to revamp the World Trade Organization. And she wants to encourage South-South trade partnerships that could help developing countries grow complementary industries and escape their current position in the global production chain, where they're stuck importing high-value finished goods and exporting cheaper um, intermediate goods. So it's all very forward looking. It's all very sensible. It all comes down to we share only one planet. Our current trade system is not up to the task of meeting the social and economic challenges of global poverty and joblessness. Meanwhile, we need a global all hands on deck effort to deal with climate change. Trade peace isn't simply something we can achieve. It is something we can't afford not to achieve. That too was a terrific chapter. Chapter six, as you know, is about the entitlement programs and we've recently gone through that. I'm not gonna go through that. I'm gonna kind of skip through it I'm just going to say, I thought this was a wonderful chapter about arguing against the stigma that surrounds the word entitlement right now. And pointing out how easy it is to fix, fix, quote unquote, the Social Security trust funds so that it wouldn't be possible to project shortfalls in the trust funds, okay, in the future, how easy it would be to fix them just by using the same language that was used uh, for, uh, for Medicare Parts B and D um, but during the Bush administration. Extend that language to everything else, and there's no more Social Security shortfall we have to worry about. It's just an accounting gimmick. There's no real there there. 
there's just a legislative thing there. And she refers to, to what Roosevelt did and the mistakes he made and to Robert Eisner and his reasoning on Social Security. And how the MMT is so much to Eisen's reasoning in that respect, in terms of their own views on Social Security. She has a nice discussion about uh, the election of 2000 and Gore versus Bush on Social Security. And she has the best account of how the trust funds fall short and are vulnerable to arguments, to uh, austerity arguments uh, that really don't apply because paying for Social Security is always a matter of Congress appropriating the money. Okay, if it appropriates the money on kind of an automatic basis, um, but, uh, but as a one year in advance kind of thing, there'll never be a solvency problem with respect to Social Security. She talks about the pension problems in the private sector and how important Social Security is, how important the okay, our Medicare system is in terms of solving the problems with our retirement crisis because we no longer have a three-legged stool we have a one-legged stool and we have to make that stool a solid something to sit on actually it has to be a solid cylinder and not a stool with any legs at all She points out that other entitlements are also in danger and that they're in danger because of the particular language that was used in passing them. And she explains how easy the language would be to change so that that okay, was not a problem. So let's go on to how we should talk about entitlements and she thinks that we should talk about them as um, um, economic rights of citizens of the United States. And that there's no argument about, uh, no argument about a lack of ability to pay. It's a matter of Congress appropriating the funds. And she knows that. But she knows that the language of our current bills have to be changed because when these accounting records um, fall to zero, uh, the law prohibits uh, the Treasury Department from paying out uh, the full benefits. If the couple of sentences that's in there are changed, uh, then there's no barrier to Congress simply paying um, automatically the Social Security benefits that are due to people. She talks about uh, what Greenspan had to say about this and Bernanke had to say about it and what Eisner has had to say about uh, the accounting problems of Social Security that are not real problems. And so that chapter is a very illuminating one. Okay, it's written in a matter that if someone understands it and it's quite simple to understand, uh, then people should be very, very angry over the fuss that's been made over Social Security running out of money. It's all nonsense. Then in the next chapter, chapter seven, 
Stephanie discusses um, our real deficits. She asserts that our fiscal deficits, our financial deficits are not real problems, but our real deficits are. And she talks about the good jobs deficit and the savings deficit. Okay, we have how savings are very maldistributed in our population, um, how regular people cannot save any longer. She talks about the health care deficit and the lack of a Medicare for all program and the financial vulnerability of Americans to, uh, to medical emergencies. Talks about the education deficit that we have, the inequalities, the infrastructure deficit. And of course, the climate deficit and the importance of taking care of that particular deficit and what a crisis it is and continues to be. And she talks about uh, the democracy deficit. Unfortunately, the book had to go to press before she had a chance to talk about uh, the COVID-19 deficit or the coronavirus deficit, if you like, in the United States. We have a huge deficit. That's a real deficit. And we're not doing as much about it as we should be doing. We're not even doing as much about the economic part of it as we should be doing. We're seeing to it that the rich and the big corporations are taken care of. That's because of our democracy deficit. She talks about having to solve all these real deficits. Then she ends talking about building an economy for the people and what is necessary to do that. She tells the story, okay, of Manny Cleaver and what he felt he could not say. And the descriptive side, okay, of MMT. So I'm going to end now. I'm going to end by saying that even though this book has not gone into everything, okay, in MMT, it didn't intend to. It picked out certain of the major deficits to talk about, certain myths okay, to talk about and to thoroughly dismiss. Some of these myths had been previously handled by Warren Mosler. Some had been previously handled um, in my books, actually by myself. Some had been previously handled by Randy Ray um, and by Bill Mitchell in his books, okay, and his blogs. I don't think anyone has handled the myths she handled here, though, as clearly as she has done. I don't think that anybody has made such a comprehensive and consistent attack on the idea of the fiscal deficit showing its relative lack of importance, showing that it in itself is not a real deficit, but that our economy has to be changed to take care of the real deficits. She's done that really beautifully. And she opens minds in this book. She opens minds um, but to other possibilities. Uh, even right at the end, <clears throat> she says, can you imagine an economy where private enterprise and public investment all combine to raise living standards for everyone? 
Can you imagine an economy where every rural and urban community has sufficient health, education, and transportation services to meet the needs of the local population? Can you imagine an economy that can measure and continually improve human well-being, not just gross domestic product? Can you imagine an economy where human activity rejuvenates and enriches all ecosystems? Can you imagine an economy where nations trade in ways that enhance living standards and environmental conditions for all parties? Can you imagine an economy comprising of a strong middle class with service and labor-based occupations that have good wages and benefits? Can you imagine an economy where we all are insured a carefree retirement, all their food, housing, and health care needs met? Can you imagine an economy where all manner of research is fully funded with a steady stream of successful ideas commercialized or rolled out to serve the public? She opens our minds to imagining all that. And she opens our minds to how we can use the fiscal policy space of the United States and the monetary sovereignty of the United States to help us to accomplish all that. <clears throat> she ends by saying, in the United States, where we have an abundance of resources and labor, there is no reason we cannot embark on a policy agenda that results in provisioning our entire population with quality health services. Uh, also providing each worker with adequate and appropriate advanced education and job training, upgrading our infrastructure to meet the needs of a low carbon world, ensuring adequate housing for everyone while redesigning our cities to be clean, beautiful, and nurturing of community spirit. We can be a global force for good, leading the way in decarbonization, providing assistance to countries with real needs, while ensuring our domestic economy thrives and no economies from small towns to urban neighborhoods are left behind. With the knowledge of how we can pay for it, it's now in your hands to imagine and to build the people's um, economy. And she is right about that and because she has opened our minds in that way and because she has for the whole book expressed things so clearly and so simply and because she's been successful, I believe, in dismissing the major myths of the neoliberals and the uh, austerity mongers. Um, I think that what she has created here is a people's book. It's a people's book because it's, it's a guide to how we can close all those deficits that we have to close. In order to build a people's economy, she not only goes into detail to help us to do that here in the United States, but she gives a little bit of guidance as to how through trade, through proper trade policies of the world economic system can be fixed so that it becomes, it becomes a collaborative system through which all can prosper and through which of the world can survive the climate crisis and create a society that can fulfill all of our legitimate needs. I think this is a really great book. Very, very well written. And simple enough 
um, um, to be comprehended by those who think about politics, think about society, think about culture, think about the role of economics in getting us to the public purpose. I don't think Stephanie has talked explicitly about the public purpose in this book, but she has talked implicitly about it. She has talked about how the public purpose can be achieved by closing the real deficits that we have and overcoming the deficits supported by myths and lack of understandings that we have been the victims of. And so it's obvious that I think this is a wonderful, most important book. I'll be reading it time after time. Okay, I'm sure. I know it doesn't exhaust the uh, the universe of fiscal myths. I know that because there are many more fiscal myths to be considered in my book, um, The Fiscal Myths of Campaign 2016. But I think Stephanie has put her finger on most of the most important of the fiscal myths here. And she's dismissed them in such an understandable and easy to read way that her book deserves to be read by all of us okay, and by everyone who wants to get to a national system That is a system for the public purpose of our society and going beyond our society to what we might one day come to define as the public purpose okay, of world society. This book is in the finest uh, tradition of progressive thinking. And it's something that everyone ought to read. So that's my review. On Monday, I'll be moving into Pavlina Chernyev's book. I believe uh, Pavlina's book is very, very important too. It zeroes in on the federal job guarantee federal job guarantee is at the core of M of the prescriptive side okay of MMT and in certain ways at the core of the descriptive side okay as well since it's so important uh, in terms of the MMT way of controlling um, um, inflation so it's appropriate that I now continue um, on Monday with the story Pavlina Cherneva has to tell. And so I'll go right on with that okay, on Monday. If you're still here, I'll now consider your comments um, for a while. So... <laughs> I think tonight I've outlasted you all, I'm afraid. I hope you liked it. Joanne says, great book. I have the audio book on Endless Loop. Whenever I'm idle, Dolores says, shared. John uh, Siena says, the government's red ink is not black ink. John Siena says, um, the U.S. dollars are the one resource we can never run out of. Lana says shared, Kay says, 
We've been ripped off so many times for so many years, decades, SMH. Steve says, hi, KK says, I wish this government would get its act together to help people so damn tired of being so poor. K says, I don't want to be rich. I just want enough to be independent and have a life worth living. Daniel Going says, we need to go after Bill Gates, Tony Fauci, and George Soros. How about uh, Donald Trump and Sheldon Adelson and uh, Jeff Bezos? How about them? And don't forget Warren Buffett either. And don't forget uh, Larry Ellison. And don't forget all the rest of them. Daniel Goheen, you have a purely right-wing bias. <laughs> Steve Wolprand says, inflation, what inflation? We're all too broke for inflation. Yes. Sean King, Steve Bonson says, Sean King, this morning, the Archbishop of Canterbury is the head of the Church of England. It's asked on BBC about my remarks saying that depicting Jesus as a white uh, European was racist and that the art should all come down. He said, I was right, and that they should be reconsidered. P.S., former police officers openly plotting to kill BLM activist Sean King. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Steve said, Jesus wasn't white if he ever existed. Okay, says, I look at Jesus as a historical figure, whether true or not. He was a great figure, okay, in history. Okay, says, my favorite Jesus story was him throwing the money changers out of the temple. That's probably everybody's favorite Jesus story. Steve says he probably existed, but wasn't a Nordic white. <laughs> Kay says, Obama was not our friend for sure. K says, I can't figure out why so many worship uh, 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 Obama. Deborah says, I share too. Deborah says, Pago is the ultimate cruelty. Steve Day says, Obama's eloquence was a smokescreen. Steve Day says, hashtag, uh, hashtag it is no Pago Nancy. Yes, Al Steve Day, he sold himself as a progressive bid. As soon as I saw his administration, I knew that was a damned lie. Obama sang Amazing Grace so well. He did? I thought he was okay. Beginning with his VP pick. <laughs> exactly, Al Stephen Day. Biden for VP was my first clue. I never could understand why any people of color would vote for Clinton or Biden. All these governors, they're on lawful orders such as you must stay home, you must wear a mask, you can't go to the beach, you must be six feet away from anybody. Oh, this is, come on, this is arrestable offense by the sheriff. <laughs> I'm afraid the sheriff would be arrested by the governors. How about that? <laughs> K says, I'm tired and about out of gas here. Laugh out loud. Didn't sleep well last night. Yawning already. Laugh out loud. Audible version. Kelton reads to us the Deficit Myth audio book. Free with a 30-day trial membership with this audio booker. Very good chapter about Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It was wonderful. K says, well, I need to go to bed. Thank you, Joan. Also, great discussion again. Stay safe and well. Love you all. Dolores says, love you too. Yeah, I love you, Kay. This book is huge for us. And Pavlina, Deborah Wilson, I liked it. I more than liked it, Deborah. I just loved it. I loved it. It was a terrific book. Okay. I guess there are four of you still holding the fort. Five. Now five of you. <laughs> You're getting bigger. I'm going to say good night. I think that's it. I think I've done it.
I've given the most extensive book review in history. This book deserved it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you for staying. Good night. Sleep tight.